we continue discussing Forgetting Mark Fisher by from Kohlbach. Uh, I would definitely suggest you read the article uh, with me and go back and listen to part one. Uh, let's continue jumping directly into this. For Marx, the emergence of bourgeois society is crucial for grasping the theory of history and of capitalism. Capitalism is not, as Fisher has it, quote, what is left when beliefs have collapsed at the level of symbolic ritual or elaboration, but the self-contradiction of bourgeois social relations of the conditions of industrial capital. Now, I've already said uh, at the ending last time, I accept this, although I think these contradictions led to industrial capital or not just caused by industrial capital. And then since contra the Fischer and Zizek, Marx thinks that capitalism does not depend on some subjectively assumed belief, namely bourgeois consciousness of the working class demanding the value of its labor, which reproduces it. I mean, excuse me, Marx thinks that, that capitalism does depend on some subjectively assumed belief, namely the bourgeois consciousness of the working class demanding the value of its labor, which reproduces capitalism below. Thus, Marx sought to critically grasp how the working class expressing the self-contradiction in its demand for its bourgeois rights under the conditions of industrial capital could become conscious of the need to overcome itself to abolish itself. Uh, I think that's a good classical Marxism, uh, but again, I would not add an industrial to that word. Agrarian capitalism's contradictions led to industrial capitalism. To bracket that element of bourgeois society out seems to be a little bit of early capitalist special pleading. Nor is it not anything that I saw Marx explicitly do. Anyway, uh, that critique aside, I still think Ephraim is, you know, one, I know that Ephraim's critique is actually pretty much consistent with Platypus's own thinking of that. Not that there's one Platypus line, but with uh, Spencer Leonard and Chris Catron's and to probably to some degree Richard Rubens and Joseph Estes, if you know who those people are, thinking on the subject. Uh, I also think, while I do get annoyed that there is this tendency by Platypus people to argue by Marx uh, assertions, uh, so they often don't quote Marx extensively when they make these arguments. Um, I do think that this actually does uh, betray a, 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 an extensive uh, reading of, of Marx, particularly his journalistic and political works, um, that one can't generally shrug off either. So if one is a Marxist, these assertions do ring as true. All right, Fisher's assertion that the left must show that everything is mere contingency raises the question of how con how a conscious subject could grasp reality such that it could be transformed. He reproduces the old antinomy of necessity and contingency, one-sidingly endorsing the latter. Marx registered antimony in response to the rise of Louis Bonaparte in 1848-1852, whereas Victor Hugo, Bonaparte's rest of power, was a contingent result of the violent act of a single individual. For Proudhon, it was the expression of a, histor of a necessary historical development. And as Marx puts it, while it was for Hugo like a bolt from the blue, Proudhon falls into the era of so-called objective historians. Marx himself tried to grasp these two opposed interpretations, necessity and contingency, determinism and volatilism, critically as a dialectical antinomy that pointed beyond itself. This is why both hyper-deterministic and hyper-individualistic readings of Marx are both available to people and both wrong. And I totally agree with Karabakh on this. He's absolutely right. Anyway, continuing. Because Fisher fall into Luz and Badu, a large bourgeois society, he allows the basis not only of the working class movement for socialism, but its critical self-consciousness and Marxism. As Lukash put it, because every prolet because the proletariat's practical goal is the fundamental formation of the whole society, it conceives of bourgeois society together with its intellectual and artistic products as to the point of departure of its own method. But for Fisher, there is no bourgeois society, and there's no point of departure for the proletarian class consciousness. We are left with mere contingency. Fisher is forced to some kind of outside, but do's communist invariant, our love and freedom, our as we shall see later, as the communism. Marx saw the proletariat class struggle as a symptom of the self-contradiction of bourgeois society, and which might right meant right, i.e. equal rights of capital and labor, and that capitalism is a historically unprecedented problem of social domination. For Fisher, on the other hand, the class struggle is a trans-historical struggle for the oppressed versus the oppressors, or for human beings who want to move in the direction of love and freedom, 
versus the gray Anglo-Saxon Protestant capitalist sorcerers, as he later puts it in Democracy as Joy. And this, I, I think this gets even worse than the Vampire Castle piece, because this is why he doesn't have, in my opinion, Fisher here, a very coherent notion of what makes one Russell uh, one working class. Russell Brand is working class because of his class origins and because of his cultural affectations, not because of what he actually does, which is the whole point for Marx. Fisher misses this. So far that when he realizes it, he's actually willing to throw away Marx's class categorizations entirely to maintain this cultural view. And yet people read him as the most accessible form of Marxism which means they don't get the point. And remember, guys, I'm the person who published a Vampire Castle essay, one of one of four and one of two people who commissioned it. Like, I, I, it's not that I hate Fisher, but it was a problem I saw in it even early on. All right. The liquidation of bourgeois society from Marxist account thus leading to the embrace of mere contingency and its counterpart, determinism. And one can see this kind of horseshoe theory of dependency and determinism, voluntarism, and, and whatnot all the time in leftist thinking. And it tends to be, it, it actually tends to, people tend to go up until they hit a wall and they invert it. All right. Uh, you can see uh, Alvin Guldner's critique of Marxism as it exists on this. Although Guldner doesn't seem to get the Hegelian nature of what Marx is trying to do, is why that, like those are both in Mars because Marx is trying to transcend them. Whether he succeeds or not is a different question, but that's what he's trying to do. All right. The Baduin delusion account of capitalism Fisher builds on is compelling him, is compelling to him because it confirms his one-sided anti-neoliberalism in which Adam Smith was thrown under the bus because we all hate Thatcher. And we and can will Tina away by declaring capitalism to be a mere contingency. I see this in David Graeber too. This has always driven me up the wall. This, this, high, this, like, if we just believe something different, it would be different. No, belief and material world both are in constant interaction with each other. They exist in a totality. You can't, like, there, you know, to, to call about to talk about them in a feedback loop is the easiest way to explain this, but even that's not sufficient. For example, his rejection of subjectivity to go against supposed neoliberal individualism instead of embracing collectivity or community remains within the neoliberal framework. As Gillian Rose wrote in Morning Becomes the Law, diagnosed in the early 1990s, the period Fisher's intellectual formation in the cybernetic culture research unit, we have given up communism only a far more deeply in love with the idea of community. Neoliberalism does not depend just on individualism, but the fetishization of the community. They formed an antimony, neither of which can neither term of which grasps society. Absolutely. Community and individual are not separate entities. The antinomy there is formed in our thinking, but it's a false antimony. Or it's real enough because it works how we parse our current social situation. I don't think it's actually even unique to neoliberalism, but it is not historically true. The community informs the individual and in both accepting and rejecting the community, the individual is formed by it and through it. The whole false binary there is maddening. Fisher's liquidation of Marxism by a leading bourgeois society from the theory of history is a symptom of the common trend on the left. And not just in recent decades. It goes back to the old left from vulgar Marxism, which neglected the question of subjectivity in favor of the positive ethic of communism. Bing, bing, bing! Point to Heidegger, who similarly dismisses the problem of bourgeois subjectivity as a Western metaphysics. Bing, bing, bing! Also point, and also leftists still do this, like today. In fact, some old lefts have actually, by picking up and reading Hegel's critique of Parmenideanism in a particular way, they have actually reread Heidegger back into early Marx. That's a different program, though. It has nothing to do with Mark Fisher. All right. The New Left, too, rejected bourgeois society as the starting point of the proletarian's method, as Susan Tongton famously argued parliamentary government, the emancipation of women, Kant, and Marx all couldn't redeem, quote, Western white civilization. The quote, cancer of human history, simply 
eradicates autonomous civilizations wherever it spreads. This account of eradication of autonomous civilization sounds very similar to Fisher's account of history, in which capitalism is the destruction of life worlds by the gray Anglo-Saxon Protestant capitalist sorcerers. It is for these reasons that the structure Fisher erected was susceptible to the shock rays of 2016. Fisher's theory of capitalism and the critique of the left that he developed from it are premised on anti-neoliberal to such an extent that the crisis of neoliberalism melted away his earlier circumspection. As a side note, I actually think Spencer Leonard is right when he points out that the crisis of Fordism melting away to neoliberalism similarly fucked up the new left. What capitalist realism ends with a call for a Marxist for a Marxist super nanny to discipline the left out of its pathological state, this return to Marx owed more to Badu and Deleuze and compounded by the longstanding liquidation of Marxism. The co this collapse took the form of two main shifts in Fisher's thought. First shift from critique of the 1960s New Left to the embrace of counterculture as acid communism and a shift from the critique of neo-social democracy to Corbynism. While Fisher was once skeptical of changes to neoliberalism signaling the end of capitalist realism because he now because he knew how the left had been wrong-footed by such changes in capitalism before, asterisk, namely the shift from Fordism to neoliberalism itself, where most of the leftist critiques in the 50s and 60s that led to the new left were critiques of Fordism. They have to then switch and defend Fordism as the welfare state is attacked later on, leading to an utter incoherence in the theory. This is Warren talking, not Ephraim, but I think Ephraim would agree with me. In 2015, the UK general election, he embraced a weak form of social democracy as a way out of neoliberalism. Yes, he did. That's also in the Vampire Castle article. And that was something I was super skeptical of. The doré of neoliberalism has been so unbearable that the signs of its cracks were overwhelming. As he wrote of the, two, of the TV election debates, capitalist realism is so deeply embedded that it's not hard to feel a frisson when, for instance, Leon Wood of uh, Plaid Semaru, which is, I think, the, the Welsh Nationalist Party, defended trade unions in the welfare state. Here is one picture of a post-neoliberal UK, a soft left regaining its confidence on one hand and a glowering far right on the other, no, noting where capitalist realists, noting nothing where the capitalist realist middle used to be. He still sees alternatives for post-neoliberalism, as he did in, in 2009, to be the soft left social democracy or an authoritarian right. But in capitulating to the former, he forgets his earlier claim that such a change within capitalism would, would perpetuate capitalist realism. Not to mention the U.S. critique of the welfare state or the earlier observations of the Frankfurt School that the Fordist welfare state was the authoritarian state. Absolutely it was. In fact, this is Varn talking, the Fordist authoritarian state and its public-private partnerships is how neoliberalism could happen in the first place. Neoliberalism could not purely emerge out of earlier forms of capitalism. I'm sorry. It is instructive to note that this shift in his thought happens before Jeremy Corbyn arrived uh, on the scenes after the 2015 election. Corbyn is not an accident in history, as the Weekly Worker Arkansas argues. He's a symptom and not the cause of a rebound social democracy on the left, which might as well have unfolded similarly without it. Indeed, this can be traced back to Obama's calls for a new deal in 2008, now rebooted as millennial socialism. My uh, take has been similar to Ephraim's that millennial socialism has actually just been progressivism put in pink dress. The, the return of social democracy is prepared by Fisher's anti-neoliberalism, which idealizes the condition of left-wing politics in the post-war era of the Fordist welfare state, like so many people do. This is why I'm talking. During this time, Fisher became close to the self-described anti-authoritarian communist activist group Plan C. They too, in 2015, as now, were willing to endorse what they call Plan B, social democracy, as opposed to Plan A, austerity, or Plan C, communism. As Fisher wrote in 2015, it perfectly possible that the labor SMP coalition would now achieve what Jeremy Gilbert and I argue that new labor could have been 
expected to attempt to make some efforts to change strategic situations in the long term to rebuild unions to re-energize local governments to facilitate the growth of an alternative media sector. The Blairites are out of are as out of date now as Blair argued old labor was in 1997. The crisis of the Labor Party in recent times offers a chance of fulfillment of what Blair had promised, but not fulfilled, not only for millennials, but for the despairing Gen X leftist. One suspects, as Fisher did come out of the 90s anti-capitalist left, that their aim is not to replace capitalism, but to mitigate its worst excesses. Similarly, as Fisher predicted in Capitalist Realism, this lowering of horizons will mean that Capitalist Realism as a pathology of the left will outlast the neoliberal era. Bam. As a further sign of the deflationary consciousness, a phrase for the left's morose conservatism marked by a passionate activism that is self-delusion, <laughs> is the self-delusion that even the left that even if the left is defeated, the tide is nonetheless in its favor. As Fisher put it in the... See, let me read that. Sorry, guys. A further sign of this deflationary consciousness, a phrase for the less morose conservatism marked by a passionate activism, is a self-delusion that even if the left is defeated, the tide is nonetheless turning in its favor. As Fisher put it in a public lecture in 2016, Corbyn might be crushed, but I think we can be confident that there wouldn't have been a Corbin without Syriza, that there is a new wave and we can now start riding it towards post-capitalism. The certain prospect of capitalist realism post-neoliberal capitalism, even under a Corbin government, has blotted out. And I would go further than maybe Ephraim. I would say we have seen that this whole vision revitalize the center, the empty capitalist realist center where I have former social Democrats praising Joe Biden. Now this is, which is not to say that I think that Trump is an alternative. I think both these things, both Trumpism and Bidenism, and how how close they resemble each other when you break down their actual practice on border walls, on renationalization, et cetera, really proves to you that no one has really understood the subjection conditions of the time. Uh, we have a little bit of this this left. I want to keep these kind of short, so we're going to stop here. Check all the show notes for all the links, and uh, go back and watch the first one if you haven't. Like and subscribe, and we'll finish this in a part three. <laughs>